Hello again. And so we start off part five, response to who wrote the Bible. Alrighty, here we go. How could God allow the military defeat to take place and the subsequent exile and torture in the land of Babylon? It now becomes a book that's concerned with suffering and liberation. And it doesn't just explore the themes of triumph, but now the concern of terror. And that's what makes the Bible such a universal book. Where does this come from? Okay, uh, I just want to address this first part here because... Um uh, he's making a claim. Well, first of all, he's trying to he's trying to dissect the intentions of the writers. In other words, where does this idea of suffering come from? And uh, you know, he says it now becomes a book about suffering, and triumph, and terror. Um, of course, he's referring to this time period of. Uh, Babylonian captivity. Now, uh, I'm just going to throw out three examples of uh, suffering that are in the Torah. Uh, number one, the story of Jacob. Uh, Jacob suffers under the hand of his uh, father-in-law Laban uh, for 20 years. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, the story of Joseph, um, who was basically, you know, betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery to uh, Egypt, uh, but eventually becomes second in command of all of the land of Egypt, and essentially saves his family. Uh, but during his stay in Egypt, he suffers greatly in that he has to go, he's thrown into prison a couple of times. And uh, so uh, the, the other example is, I'm going to give, is Israel suffering in the land of Egypt. In that after Joseph died, eventually a ruler came to power who did not know Joseph, and the Israelites were enslaved. And so... There was a period of about 400 years where the Israelites suffered slavery in Egypt. And then, of course, they were delivered. Moses comes, and uh, he is a Messianic figure which comes in and delivers the uh, nation of Israel. Um, so, basically, uh, the reason I'm pointing these three stories out is because these are all stories that are out of the Torah, the first five books. The story of Jacob, the story of Joseph, those are both out of Genesis. Um, the story of Israel, suffering in Egypt, uh, Exodus chapter 2. So basically, uh, what I'm showing here is that uh, prior to the Babylonian captivity, there was a there was this tradition in the Torah that does show this suffering and this liberation concept. Um, and so when this host says, where did this concept come from? Well, I'm pointing out those three stories right there as preceding uh, the Babylonian captivity. So it's funny that he says, this is what makes the Bible such a universal book. So he's saying that these ideas, the, the concept of the suffering and the liberation, is, is coming out of the Babylonian captivity. But I'm showing you right here that through these stories here, uh, in Genesis and in Exodus, we see this concept even prior to the Babylonian captivity. And we do see this universal concept prior to the Babylonian captivity. And so I just wanted to point this out that what we're looking at is this concept of trying to pinpoint during the Babylonian captivity some reason to make this book a universal book at that time. What I'm saying is that even prior to this, 
we see this, the Torah, as a universal book. So the argument is invalid. So we'll move on. Next up, the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem and some of the oldest Bible manuscripts in the world. My name's Robert Beckford. I've come to see Israel now. The vision and new ideas come not in the books of Moses, which start the Old Testament, but from the books of the prophets you find at the back, especially Isaiah. Okay. So he says the visionary, these visionary concepts, in other words, he's talking about this idea of suffering and liberation as a visionary concept. He says, they don't come from the books of Moses. Why no, they come from the prophets. But uh, as I just showed you here, is in the story of Jacob. And if you wanna, if you wanna read uh, Genesis chapter 31, verse 38 uh, through 42, You'll see what Jacob says in regard to this concept of suffering. He says, These twenty years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young. In other words, they have not miscarried. And the rams of thy flocks have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee. I bore the loss of it. Of my hand thou didst require it whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was. In the day, drought consumed me. In other words, he was thirsty. And the frost by night, and the sleep fled from mine eyes. These twenty years I have been in thy house. I have served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy flock. And thou hast changed my wages ten times except that the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, had been on my side, surely now thou hast sent me away, thou would have sent me away empty-handed. God hath seen mine affliction, and the labor of my hands, and hath given, and hath gave judgment yesternight. So, what is Jacob saying here to his father-in-law Laban? I suffered under you. And if it wasn't for my God, you would have sent me away empty-handed. But all these years, you know, if I was in the fields and, uh, you know, the wild beasts took away one of the flocks, I considered it my loss. You required it out of my pocket. I didn't even bring you the corpses of those dead animals. I just, I considered it uh, my loss. And took one from my own flock to to replace it you know I, I couldn't you know drink during the day I was thirsty at night I couldn't sleep because of the, the cold and the frost and I was worried about the flocks uh, for 20 years I slaved for you for your two daughters uh, you know and then you wanted me to stay because you because you said you, you know you were being blessed by my work so I stayed for six more years, and you know, during this this whole time, you were changing my my wage, you know, ten times, you know. So Jacob was suffering here under his father-in-law Laban, but God ultimately blessed him, and we see this concept in the book of Genesis. We see it in other words, we see it in the book of Moses, and what this. A commentator saying, oh, well, this is a visionary concept. The idea of suffering and of liberation. Why, you know, this is not in the book of Moses. But uh, what I'm showing you here is that, yes, in, uh, and we look at the story of Jacob, we see the concept of suffering and we see the concept of liberation and God uh, giving judgment and, and blessing Jacob despite his suffering. So uh, this is important. You know, he's making these points in the beginning. He's like, oh, by all these concepts, they come in, you know, the, the, the later prophets, especially the book of Isaiah. So we'll get into that. Significantly, the oldest existing copy of the whole book of the Bible is not a copy of the Torah. It's the book of Isaiah. 
Okay, let me just stop here. He says, significantly, the oldest copy of a book of scripture is not a book from the, from the books of Moses, but it's a book from one of the prophets, the prophet Isaiah. Why does he say significantly? Okay, in other words, he never really tells us what is significant about Isaiah being the oldest copy of the Bible. Um, what he is alluding to is, he seems to be alluding to uh, the fact that perhaps the books of Moses were not yet fully codexed or, you know, canonized at this time. Uh, this is really uh, uh, an ultra high radical liberal view because uh, most, you know, all scholars know that Isaiah meditated upon the books of Moses and this is how he came to uh, have his visionary concepts uh, of Israel. Uh, because it is in meditating upon the law, the first five books, that all of these ideas in Isaiah branch off of. And, and this particular one here, this one here of Jacob suffering under the hand of Laban, is just one example of suffering and liberation. Uh, Genesis chapter 31, verse 38 through 42. Uh, so let's move on. And in it, Isaiah adds a whole new dimension to the Bible. To okay, and then he says, and in this book of Isaiah, he adds a whole new dimension to the Bible. Okay, so what I'm telling you is that this dimension is not really an addition. What it is, is a retelling of what is already in the Torah. And I will show that to you as we go along here. Idea of the Messiah. Okay, now he says the idea of a Messiah, number one. New Eden. And a new Eden. Okay, let me just stop right there. Okay, dealing with the first claim that Isaiah somehow introduces the idea of Messiah, or that he is the first one to introduce this idea. Uh, I will show you how that is false. Uh, in fact, Isaiah meditated upon the books of the Torah, and this is why he has these visions of a, a Messiah. Um, for instance, throughout the entire first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the books of Moses. We see messianic figures, and those are, we see Noah, we see Abraham, we see Isaac, we see Jacob, whose name uh, is changed to Israel, we see Joseph, a very powerful messianic figure, and of course we see Moses, who is a uh, uh, the most definite of uh, Messianic types. And also we see Joshua, who succeeded Moses, and we could go on. Um, the fact is, is that uh, there is this idea of a Messiah throughout the books of Moses. Uh, the first, uh, one of the first mentions that we see of it is in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, in which Israel, that is Jacob, is blessing his sons. And in coming to his son Judah, he states, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, so that tribute shall come to him, and the homage of peoples be his. Uh, it is interesting that uh, that the uh, blessing uh, is in regard to a scepter not departing from Judah. In other words, there is a su succession that the scepter is being passed on to each new uh, 
Messiah figure, so to speak. Um, but it says, uh, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, so that tribute shall come to him. In other words, the staff is going to eventually rest upon, you know, one of the final one, the final ruler. Um, we also see uh, uh, this in uh, the word of Balaam in uh, Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Uh, we see that uh, he states over the nation of Israel, What I see for them is not yet. What I behold will not be soon. A star rises from Jacob. A scepter comes forth from Israel. It smashes the brow of Moab, the foundation of all the children of Seth. And so we see here in Numbers another Messianic idea. Uh, it's, it is significant because the passage in Numbers uses the same terminology. In other words, scepter. The scepter comes forth from Israel, just like in, in, in Genesis where it says, A scepter shall not depart from Judah. But this is the Messianic concept, folks. It is in the books of Moses. And uh, so uh, moving on, we do see uh, in Deuteronomy the, uh, the uh, concept of the prophet being raised up. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses states, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from among your own people. Like myself, him you shall heed. And this is in regard to the scepter. In other words, it's going to be passed on. And, and you know, it falls to Joshua. And then it falls to each succeeding ruler but this is the messianic idea expressed clearly in the books of Moses and so what we have in, in this video series is somebody making the claim that well it's not just somebody I mean a lot of people would like to make this claim that Isaiah is the first one who, who has these revolutionary new ideas of suffering, liberation, and the Messiah, when we can see these ideas very clearly in the books of Moses. Now, in regard to the other point, which is the New Eden concept, we could just state that this is a, uh, a notion of afterlife, or uh, the idea of the world to come. In other words, the gates of Eden. Um, again, they're saying why this is a new concept which um, Isaiah is infusing into the culture here. It was not there before. Well, I would have to disagree again because what we can see in the first five books of the Torah are as such. Beginning with Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 through 24, we see the concept of an afterlife already being hinted at. Uh, in other words, in uh, this uh, verse, it says uh, in the chapter, And the Lord God said, Now that the man has become like one of us, knowing good and bad, what if he should stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat it and live forever? So we see that concept of living forever. And that it is possible for them to live forever. In other words, uh, eternity, uh, eternal life. And uh, so the Lord banished him from the Garden of Eden to till the soil from which he was taken. He drove the man out, stationed east of Eden, east of the Garden of Eden, the, cherubu, the cherubim and the fiery ever turning sword to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, that tree of life is there and we could reach out and grab the fruit of it and live forever. 
but it's being guarded, you know, until it's sort of implied, you know, until a certain time. Um, so we do see here the idea of the gates of Eden. In other words, at those gates, you know, and in the garden, you know, there is there is a tree of life. And if you eat of it, you will live forever. And uh, so we do see this concept. Um, also, uh, we see uh, in chapter 5 of Genesis, uh, verse 23 and 24, uh, the mention of Enoch, and uh, it says, All the days of Enoch came to 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more, for God took him. In other words, God took him to be with him in eternity. Uh, in other words, Enoch is living forever right now with God. So that concept, you don't have to believe, you know, you don't have to believe this. You don't have to believe any of this. But what I'm saying is that the concept of eternal life is in those first five books of the Moses. Now, uh, there is another concept in the five books of Moses, which is termed as gathering to one's people. And we do see this in a number of the patriarchs. Uh, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 8, we see, uh, And Abraham breathed his last, dying at a good ripe age, old and contented, and he was gathered to his kin. In other words, he went to be with his family. You know, he, he died, and he was gathered to his family. So, we see this concept of a gathering to one's family after one dies. Also, uh, we see that in uh, we see that with uh, Moses. Actually, uh, we see it with Jacob, and we see it with Moses. Uh, with Jacob, we see in Genesis chapter 49, verse 33, when Jacob finished his instructions to his sons, he drew his feet into the bed, and breathing his last, he was gathered to his people. And then for Moses, we see uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16, the Lord said to Moses, you are soon to lie with your fathers. Um, so, you know, piecing it all together, folks, we do see this notion of, a, of an afterlife, or new Eden, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I would like to also bring up another point about Egypt, and we have to realize that Israel was in Egypt for about 400 years in slavery. And as you know, Egypt was a very death-obsessed culture. And they had a very detailed uh, view of the afterlife. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they believed in the afterlife so much that they wanted everything buried with them to be with them in the afterlife. You know, they had their slaves buried with them. They had food buried with them. They had all their riches buried with them. And so here we have the nation of Israel who is living in Egypt for 400 years and uh, they come out of Egypt. Moses delivers them through the power of the Lord out of Egypt. And what do we have is a almost a rejection of that concept of this death of Seb's culture of Egypt. In other words, the Torah is about life. It's about this life. And really... Um, you know, a testament to the fact that this life uh, is just as important as the afterlife, but we're not going to worry about the afterlife because we're here right now. We're going to live how we should live right now. And that's what the Torah, you know, 
that's what the focus of the Torah is. It's you know, live your life for the Lord right now, and uh, you know, don't be like Egypt, you know, with this uh, death obsession and obsession of the afterlife. Um, it's not to say that that there is no concept of afterlife in the Torah. No, as you can see, as I'm showing you here, these concepts of you know the the uh, the tree of life. You know, if you can reach out and grab the fruit, you'll live forever. Uh, that there's this gate at Eden, and that there it's being guarded by the angels. Uh, you know, we see Enoch; he was taken up to be with the Lord because he walked with the Lord. Uh, we see this concept of gathering to one's peoples. Okay. Now, another another concept that we see, uh, which is uh, not in the books of Moses, but we do see it in the book of 1 Samuel, and that is significant because 1 Samuel dates prior to Isaiah, and uh, what we see in chapter 28, verse 3 through 25, is the story of King Saul consulting which, with the witch of Endor to summon the spirit of the recently deceased prophet Samuel, and uh, we see the story, and so what the story proves is that yes, the people of Israel did have a concept of the afterlife. They believed, you know, that there was an afterlife and that the spirits were there. Uh, so that's another another point I just wanted to bring up. Now, there is another speculation I would bring up, and that is in regard to the reading cycle of the books of Moses. And this is only a speculation on my part, but go with me here. The reading cycle as of today is that Israel reads through all five books of the Torah every year. And when they get to the end of that year, they start over at the book of Genesis, and they go through the readings one by one until they get to the very end of Deuteronomy, at which time they begin over again reading from the book of Genesis. And so what we see here is that start out in Genesis and you end up in Genesis. In other words, you start out in Eden and you end up in Eden. And so there is this notion of this idea that, yeah, that's how it's going to be. We started out in Eden and we're going to end up in Eden. And so this is just speculation on my part, but perhaps Isaiah looking at this, you know, maybe he did see this, maybe he didn't. Um, but Again, speculation, but I've given you, you know, one, two, three, four, five other reasons uh, uh, that I've shown you that this concept of afterlife, uh, world to come, is very clearly in the books of Moses and prior to the time of Isaiah. And so the notion that this is a radical new concept in Isaiah, you know, Isaiah brings forth this concept of uh, a new Eden, and uh, he brings forth a new concept of uh, this Messiah, and uh, oh, the concepts of suffering and liberation are brand new in the book of Isaiah. Um, well, I just have shown you, you know, uh, systematically why I don't believe that that is so. And so uh, let's move on. The idea of the Messiah and a new Eden. Isaiah counts it a remarkable new idea. Eden is going to appear again in the end of days. With the vision of all nations, not just Israel, are coming to Jerusalem seeking the word of God. Okay, um... Now he brings into this concept of of all nations uh, coming to uh, seek the word of God. And so, let me just touch on that. So what we have here is this concept of universality, a universal salvation of all mankind. And uh, they're saying, why, this is a new and radical concept in the book of Isaiah. And you don't see this in the books of Moses. 
Well, again, I'm going to have to disagree, and I'm going to give you three references. Genesis 12, uh, verse 3. We see in the blessing of Abraham, we see... I will bless those who bless you and curse him that curses you and all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. So we see this concept of universality, all the families of the earth. And then we see it when, uh, when Jacob uh, is receiving a blessing. It says in Genesis chapter 28 verse 14, all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. We see it again, the universality. Um, now, the last one I'll give you in reference to this is very significant because not only is it in reference to all peoples, but it is a messianic reference as well, and I gave it to you before. It was Genesis chapter 49. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, so that tribute shall come to him, and the homage of peoples be his. So you see this universality of peoples. So, uh, you know, it's the nations. So what we see here is the ruler and the homage of peoples to that ruler. We see the Messiah. We see all people. It's a universality or a universal blessing that is being addressed here in the first book of Moses. And again, there's this claim being made that, why, this is a new concept in Isaiah. Well, what we keep forgetting is that Isaiah was a prophet. And what did the prophets do day and night? Meditate upon the law of the Lord. But this is what it says in the Psalms. To meditate upon the law of the Lord. This is what the righteous man does. Meditates upon the law of the Lord. What is the law of the Lord? The books of Moses. The books, the five books, the first five books of the Bible. And so, uh, let's move on. Isaiah lived in the 8th century BC, before the exile. He believed the new world would be brought into being by a great Messiah or chosen one. For uh, Isaiah, the Messiah is the person who will come from the house of David at the end of days. And in his time, as there will be this peace between the lion and the lamb, and he will judge his nation and the other nations in peace. During the exile, the book of Isaiah was continued by someone else. Okay, let me just stop right there and just say, he just says, during the exile, the book of Isaiah was continued by someone else. You know, and he just throws that out there. That, of course, is, uh, is a higher textual criticism. Uh, he doesn't even really, like, make a case for it. You know, it's funny how he's made such a case. Well, he didn't even really make a case for the four sources for the, uh, for the, uh, the book of the books of Moses, he just sort of throws them out there like, this is what it is, and, you know, just accept it. <laughs> and he does the same here with the book of Isaiah, when in fact, uh, many would argue that the book of Isaiah was written by Isaiah. <laughs> okay. But I'll put some links in there, you know, on the unity of Isaiah. And again, when you get into this concept of unity, there's this theological unity versus uh, like one author. Uh, what I'm referring to is a unity of authorship. So, um, you know, if you want to do some reading on that, uh, probably in the future I'm going to do a video on uh, the unity of Isaiah. Um, but let's just move on. I'm going to just, I just wanted to point that out that he just throws that out there and he's just, he doesn't. Uh, back it up at all. It just Oh, by the way! <laughs> so, let's just listen to his argument here. In the process, a startling new idea emerged of Israel redeemed from suffering and rejection. Okay.
Okay, and then again, as I told you, he says, he's bringing up this idea again of, of Israel being redeemed through suffering and rejection. And he calls it a startling new idea. Um, but, well, uh, when I started the video, I told you, uh, I gave you three stories of uh, this concept of suffering, uh, re rejection. And the number one being that, that story of Jacob and how he suffered with his uh, father Laban. The other one was a uh, story of uh, Joseph and uh, how he suffered for his family. And if you read in uh, Genesis chapter 45, uh, verse 7 and uh, verse 8, we can see what Joseph says in regard to his suffering and rejection. He says, God has sent me ahead of you to ensure your survival on earth and to save your lives in an extraordinary deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his household and ruler over the whole land of Egypt. And so, what is Joseph talking about here? He's talking about how his brothers threw him into a pit, you know, and then he gets sold into slavery to Egypt. You know, he, he suffers in prison, you know, a couple times. Um, and he, what does he say? You know, he says this was this was all this suffering. It was supposed to be so that I could deliver our family. You know, well, he was suffered and he was rejected. And then deliverance came out of that. And so we do see that concept. It's not a radically new concept. It's not a startling new concept in Isaiah. It's a reoccurring theme that the prophets continue to meditate upon. So... Uh, Let's move on. This idea was a way of dealing with the problem of how the God of Jerusalem had allowed the exile to happen. He suffered in order to atone for the sins of the nations. Okay, before I move on here, let me just... Uh, he says, you know, this, this, this whole idea of suffering was to explain, you know, why we were suffering in... Babylon to explain why, why Israel was suffering in Babylon. And, he, you know, he's saying that why it's Isaiah who came up with this. It was Isaiah who came up with this. But it, it was not. I'm telling you, folks, read your Torah. <laughs> okay. You want to look another example? We have the example of Israel's suffering in Egypt. After Joseph dies, we see in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. A long time after that, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cried out. And their cry from help in the bondage rose up to God. God heard their moan. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and took notice of them. And so we do see that they were suffering in Egypt. But God heard their suffering. And so, what, um, first of all, this is based on, this is all based on a premise that, oh, why, uh, while the Israel was in exile, somebody else continued to write the, the book of Isaiah. So you have Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. And so, uh, oh, well, you know, I'm not even getting into that. But, you know, there's some links, there's some links in the sidebar. And uh, you can look at those in regard to the unity of the authorship of Isaiah. And, uh, but at any rate, the argument that I'm making really has nothing to do with the, the unity of the authorship. It has to do with the concept that these ideas 
very much indeed pre-existed the Babylonian captivity folks. All right, now what we're moving on to next is an idea of Israel's suffering for the nations. So uh, let's get into that now. Nations. This is why we suffer. The sin of the nations is their worship of idols. And we are punished for their sin. But it is not only that they suffer for the nations in order to atone for them, they have a mission. And this is something that we see in many ver verses in, in this book. I send you now myself. Okay, so uh, he's talking about the suffering of Israel again. And not only do they suffer for uh, themselves, but they suffer for the nations. And so the message is that why Isaiah, he introduces this concept brand new. It wasn't in the books of Moses, when in fact we do see that. And I have pointed that out to you previously, and I'll point it out again, also adding this point of suffering on the behalf of somebody else. And that is uh, in regard to the uh, story of Joseph, and suffering for others. In Joseph's suffering, he suffers, he suffers for others. He suffers for the sake of his family. Why, he didn't suffer for no reason. He wasn't thrown into a pit, sold into slavery to Egypt for no reason. But he came to his position of authority in Egypt for a reason. His suffering was for a reason. And that was for the sake of his family. And so we do see that very clearly. Again, Genesis 45, uh, verse 7 and 8. Um, so, the other, uh, the other point is uh, Israel being chosen uh, to serve on behalf of the nations. In other words, the concept of being chosen, or a chosen nation. And uh, this is, is really prominent in the books of the Torah. For instance, if we look in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 through 6, it says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now then, if you obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession amongst all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine, but you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is very significant because what this is really in regard to is Israel as a servant to the nations. In other words, Israel was chosen to be priests to the nations. And, uh, you know, furthering this concept we look in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 it says for you are a people consecrated to the Lord your God all of the peoples of the on the earth the Lord your God chose you to be his treasured people it is not because you are the most numerous of peoples that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you indeed you are the smallest of peoples but it was because the Lord favored you and kept the oath he made to your fathers that the Lord freed you with a mighty hand and rescued you from the house of bondage from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And so we see here this, this concept of the Lord keeping his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what I'm getting at here is Israel being chosen to serve on behalf of the nations? The, the, the concept of their being chosen, their chosenness, is for the sake of the nations. They are servants to the nations. 
and in forwarding this this idea even more, we look to Deuteronomy chapter four, verse six through eight, and the concept of what is the purpose of the Torah? Why is this chosen nation to keep the Torah? Why? Well, it says, observe them faithfully, that is the mitzvot, for that will be proof of your wisdom and discernment to other peoples, who on hearing all these laws will say, surely that great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what great nation is there that has a God so close at hand as is the Lord our God, whenever we call on him? Or what great nation has laws and rules as perfect as all this teaching that I set before you this day? And so you see here again this concept of all nations looking at Israel and saying, what, uh, you know, a discerning people that they have all these laws, that they have the Torah, which is such a righteous and fair uh, set of instructions and laws, and that all the nations look, look to Israel as the uh, uh, nation that God has chosen, and that the people look to Israel as a light of the nations, so to speak. And so, again, you see this, this concept of their being chosen as a kingdom of priests, you know, uh, a kingdom of, the exact wording is, is uh, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So there is this standard that the Lord wants in, in his world. He wants to have a presence, his presence of holiness. And he chose the nation of Israel to serve in that capacity, to, to serve for the sake of the nations. And in, uh, in forwarding this concept further, we see the idea of the plagues. And what was the purpose of the plagues of Egypt? Well, um, in Exodus uh, chapter 9, verse 14 and verse 16, we see it says in verse 14, For this time I will send all my plagues upon your person and your courtiers and your people in order that... You may know that there is none like me in all the world. Okay? In verse 16 it says, Nevertheless, I have spared you for this purpose in order to show you my power, and in order that my fame may resound throughout the world. Okay? So you see that in the very establishment of the nation of Israel, in bringing them out of Egypt, the Lord is very concerned with his fame resounding throughout the world. And what is it that the Lord states? He says, You are to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And what is it that they are to do as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? They are to keep the Torah for the sake of the nations. And the, uh, the last thing that I'm going to, to submit forward is this uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Festival of Sukkot, in that every year the nation of Israel was said to have offered 70 bulls in regard to the 70 nations in the world at that time. And uh, all of the uh, Jewish sages agree that in Numbers chapter uh, 29, starting at verse 12, um, uh, in regard to the festival of tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot, um, you see a countdown of, of um, a number of bulls being offered each day. The first day is 13 bulls, the second day 12 bulls, the third day 11 bulls, the fourth day 10 bulls, um, the fifth day 9 bulls, the eighth day 8 bulls, seventh day seven bulls if you add all that up it comes to 70 and uh and it was said that these 70 bulls were were uh, were sacrificed for the sake of the nations 
In other words, they are keeping their uh, command. They're, they are living out the Torah in that they are offering up sacrifices for the sake of the nations, for the peace of the nations. In fact, uh, uh, even to this day, there is a prayer in the Siddur, Tefilat Yesharim, of the Sephardic tradition. And the prayer goes like this. Our Father in heaven, in antiquity our ancestors used to sacrifice to you on the festival of Sukkot, 70 sacrifices for the peace and well-being of the nations of the world. And we, your holy people Israel, implore you on this sacred festival from Jerusalem, the city of peace, from Zion, the seat of your glory. Please have mercy on the countries and nations and keep them from war that destroys the world. Your land, we beseech you, King of Peace, and still speedily in the hearts of all nations a spirit of peace and brotherhood to unanimously seal a covenant of peace forevermore, as is your destiny in the worlds of your words of your holy prophets, in the vision of the end of days. Amen and amen. And so we see here this whole concept of Israel as a kingdom of priests to the nations. Now you tell me, how could this concept be new in Isaiah's time if they were already forwarding it in the time of Moses? So, no. What I'm saying is that these ideas are present. Even if they are present in seedling form, they are present in the Torah. They are also present in much more advanced forms than this series would advocate. So, moving on, let's move to the next point. With the idea of a mission and a messiah, I think that's the moment the Bible truly becomes a universal document. It stops being a book just for the Jews, and by offering hope for the future, becomes a book for everyone because we all want a future of peace and security. The idea of... Okay, let me just stop there. Um, Basically, I've just given you all of the reasons why all of these ideas pre-existed Isaiah in one form or another, and that these are not new and radical ideas that Isaiah is putting forward. So, um, first of all, Israel had a mission prior to the Babylonian captivity, and they had a concept of the Messiah prior to the Babylonian captivity. So his statement that with the idea of a mission and a Messiah, he believes that this becomes a universal book now. He believes basically that the book of Isaiah is what makes the Bible a universal book. And I'm telling you that no, that's not a proper rendering of the Bible. In fact, the Bible, I could say, is a universal book you could, you, you could look at each book of the Bible and, and see a universality in each book of, of the Bible, in my opinion. Uh, you could see that in a lot of, lot of other literature. You could see that in a lot of other literature. So the argument that, you know, this used to be a book just for the Jews, um, it's, in other words, it stopped being a book just for the Jews, and now it's for everyone. Well, that's not really valid, because although this book is concerned very much with the nation of Israel, it, is also, uh, it also makes mention of the other nations, and the fact that Israel is under a covenant with the Lord for the sake of the nations. And so, uh, again... It's a it's a it's a weak argument. It's an invalid argument to uh, to try to push forth this Isaiah theory. Um, even you know, if, if, even if we disregard the whole you know, first Isaiah, second Isaiah, who authored the book of Isaiah, I'm telling you all that these concepts in the book of Isaiah uh, pre-existed Isaiah. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, the idea of suffering on one's on, on somebody else's behalf. 
the idea of uh, suffering and liberation, you know, the the universality of, uh, of the blessings, you know, that come forth from God's word. The uh, what else? Notion of afterlife, you know, or a new Eden. Uh, these concepts predate the uh, Babylonian captivity. So uh, let's move on. Peace and security. The idea that one's own suffering isn't just redemptive for you, but redemptive for everyone is truly amazing. And it's at the heart of the teachings of Martin Luther King. So what next? How far could the Bible go? How much more can be updated and amended? Okay, let me just stop there. I just uh, I just made mention of uh, the idea of suffering on uh, behalf of somebody else. I mentioned you know those three stories of Jacob, uh, Joseph, uh, Israel suffering in Egypt, Israel uh, taking on the mission to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation uh, for the sake of the nations, sacrificing the seventy bulls every year on the festival of Sukkot for the sake of the nations. This is this is this was all pre-Babylonian, folks. Pre-Babylonian captivity. So uh, uh, now he says, "Well, now what next? Uh, you know, how much further can the Bible be rewritten and reconstructed?" And you know, up to this point, I would still have to say that uh, you know he makes these statements because he has come to a belief in them. Okay, just like I have a belief that. He's wrong. <laughs> so, um, so uh, let's move on. In 1947, there was an amazing discovery. A Bedouin shepherd stumbled across some ancient scrolls concealed in a cave by the Dead Sea. Judging by the handwriting, the scrolls had been produced about a hundred years before the birth of Christ by an extreme Jewish sect called the Essenes. So hardline, they even dared to rewrite the Bible itself. This, the Temple Scroll, is a revised rewritten edition of the Torah of the books of Moses, and it irons out all the inconsistencies which derive from the different versions. Alright, let me just stop right there. Um, he's uh, talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and specifically the Temple Scroll. Uh, he he talks about the Essenes. He says, "Oh well, they were a hardline extremist uh, Jewish sect, and uh, they were so hardline that they even dared to rewrite the Bible. And in the Temple Scroll, they seem to work rework work out inconsistencies between the books." Uh, right now, what I would just have to say to all this is, number one, yes. If it was the Essenes, because we're still uh, debating whether it was the Essenes or not who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, that if it was the Essenes, that uh, whoever it was, that yes, they were a hardline Jewish sect. In other words, they were outside of the uh, accepted norm of Jewish society. And uh, so. Uh, one of the things that they did in the Temple Scroll is they combine the different readings from Numbers, from, I think Leviticus. And so they combine these readings, and yet they do not they do not um, you know, call them by the previous names. In other words, they're not calling it the Book of Numbers. They're not calling it the Book of Leviticus. But it is another book which is putting those verses together, sort of like in a commentary form. Now, the one thing that they do do is they do begin to attribute some of these things to Moses in regard to stuff like carrying the wood for the sacrifice and you know, other, other things that are probably more in regard to oral Torah. Uh, they begin to attribute to Moses, uh, almost like it's, a, it's old scripture, you know, new revelation, kind of like the book of Enoch outside of the canon of the Jewish scriptures. And so uh, so 
basically what he's saying is, oh yeah, this uh, this uh, esoteric uh, hardline Jewish sect, uh, they're they're rewriting what they want to rewrite. And why would we be surprised about that if they are hard? If they are like fanatical, you know, to the outside of the spectrum of Jewish culture, uh, wouldn't it make sense that uh, that they would be so, and that they would be, uh, 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 you know, prone to visionaries, you know, visions or whatever? But uh, maybe they're more uh, fanatical. Than part of the uh, normal Jewish culture and so then we would have every reason to, to say oh, uh, no wonder it wasn't included in the Bible no wonder they were rejected by Jewish society because they tried to rewrite the books of Moses so uh, let's move on so why aren't these Dead Sea Scrolls part of the Bible today? This man is continuing Moses without any uh, fear. But you know, the rest of the people of Israel in this period saw things completely different. For them, the canon was sealed. No prophecy anymore, no revelation anymore. Any effort to continue the revelation of the biblical period with creation of new revisions and new books is going to be rejected. Okay, so basically, uh, this uh, professor or this, this gentleman is talking about why um, no new revelation is being accepted. Well, I would have to differ with that particular wording because what, what this Jewish sect did was try to words into Moses' mouth. Uh, that's not what Isaiah or any of the other prophets uh, ever tried to do. Uh, you know, to call this new revelation, uh, well, there's new revelation and then there's, there's revelation that goes against previous revelation. And so that's what we're seeing here. And so to ask a question like, why wasn't this included in the Bible? Well, it's very clear why it wasn't included in the Bible. If you're going to go against the, the original you know, revelation of the five books of the Torah, then you're going to be considered outside of the, you're going to be outside of the fringe of uh, Jewish society, because this is not what the Torah says. It says that uh, when a prophet uh, arises, that what they say is going to fall in line with Lord has already revealed, and that uh, what he says is going to come to pass, you know, along that sort of lines. So when when this fringe group, you know, dares to, uh, you know, say, oh yeah, by the way, Moses said this also, uh, very quickly they are dismissed as lunatics and heretics on the fringe, and then you know, we have our scholars today who look at this and say, oh, we'll see, you know, uh, this is evidence of the fact that, uh, that they're, they reached a point where they would no, they were no longer ready for further revelation. Well, that's not true. That's just not true because uh, there were many uh, commentators and, uh, and sages at the time, and uh, we have all this other revelation in the, uh, in the Talmud, Midrash, which which was accepted as new revelation, you know, based upon previous revelation, which did not conflict uh, the previous revelations. So uh, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, so let's move on. So the rewriting is over. It's absolutely amazing how sacred books are created. Let me just stop here. He says, so the rewriting is over. It's absolutely sacred uh, how these holy books are created. And uh, and I would, first of all, number one, I would say that the rewriting was over. Because I don't believe that there was rewriting to begin with. <laughs> and uh, all of the reasons they've given up to this point in regard to the Jewish scriptures, 
uh, are still riddled with uh, many questions that need to be addressed. And, uh, and so this, as I've said, this gentleman has come to a belief in how he thinks the Bible was put together. It's a documentarian view. It's a higher critical view. And that's okay. He can have that view. Uh, he doesn't seem to put forth very good reasons for holding that view. But I'm giving you many reasons why I believe those views are incorrect. Then he says, it's absolutely sacred how these books are written. And I would say, according to his view, the documentarian view, I don't see that as very sacred. And I don't know what he's referring to as being the sacred process of rewriting the Bible, because to me, the whole process that he has put forth sounds like a, a complete sham, a scam upon the, uh, the people of Israel, that their whole history is some sort of a imagination, and, uh, you know, just a story, you know, just a story. It's absolutely sacred, but it's a story. <laughs> so he's got his little uh, yarmulke on, his kippah, and he's sitting in front of a Torah scroll. And, uh, so let's move on. In this synagogue, as is the case in every synagogue around the world, the scrolls of the Torah are kept in a sacred place, the tabernacle, and these are the privileged texts. You can comment on them, but you can't change them. Around 100 BC, the Jews decided that this was their Bible. But once you've completed the... Alright, again, so he makes another statement again. I've already put forth all of my reasons why, why I disagree with uh, his whole documentarian view. And uh, So here, let's go to his next statement now. So now he says, it, uh, once you have the word of God written it, uh, you cannot change it. Boy, that's going to lead you to some dangerous places. He's got this ominous music playing. Again, the the ominous music uh, in the background. And, uh, so let's go on. voice came out and said, Abraham, this is the entrance to paradise. And the heavenly voice says, this here is the burial place of Adam and Eve. A place that connects our physical world to higher spiritual world. The entrance to paradise. We're on the road to Hebron. I'm going to meet a rabbi there, Rabbi Simcha Hotmar, who is a Jewish rabbi in the Jewish settlement there. Really interested in meeting him because I want to know how he reads the Old Testament. According to the book of Genesis, the patriarch Abraham is buried in Hebron, so the West Bank town is sacred to both Jews and Muslims. The present tomb of Abraham was originally built by King Herod for the Jews. Then it became a mosque. It now houses a synagogue as well. The Jewish community here was expelled during riots in 1929. Only after 1967 did Jewish settlers return. As extreme Zionists, they believe their rights here are late. Okay, let me just stop right there. He uses the term extreme Zionists, so... Okay, whatever. Um, I suppose uh, you could call them Zionists, but I think he's really emphasizing that word extreme Zionists. Um, you know, it talks about them being thrown out and then returning. So obviously there was there's a little tension in the area, but um, this 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 is you know he mentioned Zionism before he brings up Zionism again and so you know you kind of think like well what's this program about is it about who wrote the Bible are we talking about Zionism you know he's like well hey you know these Zionists don't have any right to to be Zionists because their Bible is just a bunch of stories it's not really real you know. <laughs> Alright, let's, uh, let's listen. Read down in the Hebrew Bible. We believe every word of the Bible to be divinely ordained, 
God giving it to Moses and being written down for future generations. The Torah describes in great detail in chapter 23 in the book of Genesis the purchase of the cave, the field surrounding it. Abraham negotiating with the children of Chet and Ephron, the mayor of Hebron, and the purchase of this place. I think each and every one of us lies to belief. Sometimes the belief may be covered up with science or with technology, intellectual pursuits. But deep, deep down, every Jew knows and every Jew believes. Uh, let me just stop right there. Um, it seems like he just took a comment from this rabbi out of context, because I have no idea what he said. I'm going to back it up a little bit. And, uh, the purchase of the cave, the field surrounding it. So he's talking Abraham about negotiating that. negotiating with the children of Chet and Ephron, the mayor of Hebron, the purchase of this place. I think each and every one of us lies Right here. Sometimes the belief may be covered up with science or with technology. What belief? Intellectual pursuits. But deep, deep down, every Jew knows every Jew, knows every Jew believes. Every Jew believes. See, he says, deep, deep down, every Jew knows and every Jew believes. What? Uh, it's almost like he just t picked and chose what he wanted to to put in this commentary. I wanted to hear what this rabbi had to say. But he totally cut out whatever he was saying, just put it in there. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so now we're coming to this wedding section here. So let's uh, watch this. that night there's a wedding in the square but it's more than just a family or religious occasion it's also deeply political the bridegroom is the great grandson of one of the founding fathers of the settler movement here beneath the walls of the tomb of abraham are the true believers god said this was their land once the arabs kicked us out of the old shame Yet here we are now, gathering in prayer. We hope, with God's help, that one day, every... Let me just say this. Um, from the t start of this section where he's talking to the rabbi, and I just wanted to point this out. I don't know if this was on purpose, but you see that the, uh, the producer, the, the gentleman, Robert Beckford, who does this commentary, this... This, this presentation. Earlier on, when he goes to the other synagogue, to that other rabbi, he puts his little kip on. He puts on his little yarmulke. He goes into the synagogue. He's talking with this other rabbi who's very liberal, uh, documentarian, very liberal, uh, very liberal, higher critic of the Jewish scriptures. He happens to be Jewish. And so he's sitting there and he's he's in a sense giving him honor giving the lord honor by putting on his kippah his yarmulke in the presence of that in that synagogue there but when he goes to visit this uh, this rabbi he's not wearing a kippah he's not wearing his yarmulke now i'm not saying that he did this on purpose it's just that it's not like a big deal you know, it's normally there's kippas you know, lying around every synagogue. You can go and you can get one and you can put it on. Again, at this wedding, you see him, and what does he have? He has a baseball cap backwards. He's wearing it backwards. He's sitting there in the wedding just kind of looking at it, and you can tell he's just seething. He's just like, oh, these Zionists. You know, <laughs> you know I'm not going to wear a kippa because... You know, I'm not going to stand with them. You know, so you know he's being selective in his. Uh, okay, maybe I went a little too far with that. You know, maybe he just forgot his kippa and he wasn't really thinking about it, or maybe you know subconsciously he really is. You know, kind of doesn't want to want to want to participate in the in the gathering here. You know, so uh, let's move on. Okay, and that ends uh, part five in response to who wrote the Bible. And uh, God bless you all, and keep seeking truth.